Welcome to ASM Connected, the podcast brought to you by ASM Technologies. In every episode, we look at emerging trends and tech within the industry, meeting key speakers, futurists and business leaders from across the globe. In this episode, ASM Technologies' Ian Tomkinson meets Jill Holloway, Operations Director for Insight. Jill talks through her expertise on agility within large and small companies, digital innovation, emerging technologies within the sector, the future of the working environment, and also the vast amount of unicorn companies coming out of the US. All of that to come on ASM Connected. Jill, thanks for joining me today. My absolute pleasure. We're going to talk about two of my most favourite things, me and Insight. So really <laughs> delighted to join you. Brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, one thing I, I did notice before I was doing a bit of background uh, research on your LinkedIn profile, you will also cover a couple of my favourite topics. Your bio reads leading Amir operations by influencing exceptional client experience using process, culture and technology. and I love hearing about business culture. So I think that, you know, business culture is really, really important. And technology is my other big thing. Process, I'll leave that to other people because <laughs> yeah, they're, they're better at it than me. Um, but yes, I do like those things, quite passionate about those things. Our outline plan for today is uh, topics that are close to my heart and uh, I get really excited about talking about, which is emerging technology innovation, which I'll come to shortly, and agility as well. And they're widely banded terms around in the industry at the moment, very topical. Um, I'm sure most uh, people in the tech sector and in the channel have got innovation or agility written in their website somewhere. So I'll start us off with some warm-up questions. And I suppose the, the first question, which is obviously very topical, it's been a difficult 18 months for everybody, really challenging in a, in a number of ways. The way that we work has, has changed significantly. How have you adjusted to that? And are you one of the big home working advocates? So I guess it's a two part answer. One, how have I personally adjusted and actually how has Insight adjusted? So I would say that for myself personally, I was not a work from home fan previously. I liked the process of going into the office, doing a day's work, coming home. You know, I might go to a client for a day, I might go to a vendor for a day or a distributor or, you know, any one of our um, EMEA offices. But I always liked that process of interacting with people, being visible, being engaged. So, when we switched off the lights on one day and we're all at home the following day, that was quite a baptism of fire for me personally. I think I adjusted really well because you have no choice. What I am is get on and figure it out sort of person. Find a way there's always a way. So I found a way to adjust. Now clearly, you know, the additional considerations of homeschooling and you know people around maybe falling ill and the news being quite relentless and difficult made in time that a challenge but I have to say insight were superb you know, we were able to switch the lights off and everybody be fully functional there were quite a number of people who weren't quite as fastidious about going into an office as I was so actually it allowed us all to just get on with the job our warehouses remained open throughout so there was no closing there. But actually, for me, I learned a lot of new skills, skills that I didn't have before that I do have now. And now I think I'm a big advocate of balance. So at the moment, I'm going into the office two days a week and um, I'm really enjoying that time. But as usual, there are people that will come and want to have a conversation with you, that want to interact with you, and you can't substitute that. You can learn a lot of new things that way. You can deliver a lot of support and advice and guidance to people in that way. But when I work from home, I am able to really focus. You know, my diary is back to back constantly. And do I feel the need to have those meetings in front of people? No, generally not. I feel that I've got a strong communication style. So I'm able to get across the messages that I need to in a way that resonates with them. And because I've always, certainly for the past three years, had teams across EMEA, I can't be in front of everybody all at the same time anyway. So I don't have to repeat myself 
eight times for the eight different countries I might have to visit, I can get that message across in a single way. And you have to change it up and you have to grow and develop in that sort of new emerging technology manner so that it continues to have the same power. But actually, I think this now just allows people to be who they are, do what they need to do. And, you know, some people are desperately getting back into the offices, others are more resistant. And it's just allowing us to be agile. And being truly agile doesn't mean one thing or another. It means everything in between. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I do get that. And you know, I, I think I had some you know, times where you'd be logging on at eight o'clock in the morning and you'd still be on calls six, seven o'clock in the evening. And it, it can be quite relentless working from home, but it does give you that focus without those disruptions and someone standing at the end of your desk with a question that they probably wouldn't ask if you're online. My opinion is I do like the hybrid idea because I do think some of those water cooler conversations, as I call them, I do think they're important because you get to understand firsthand what's going on in the business. And as you say, if you're client facing and if you're on site for a day, you don't just go into the meeting room and have a conversation with that individual, do you? You tend to bump into people along the way. And sometimes you can get more out of those conversations than you can perhaps the formal meeting that you actually turned up for. Absolutely. However, you know, I I think it it is, it's the balance of all of those things blended together. Knowing when is the right time to travel, when is the right time to be on site with people, when is the right time to have that focused time at home. Ultimately, from my perspective, if Insight benefits and our clients ultimately benefit from teammates not having to have sometimes very long commute times, particularly if they're in the southeast, they have tended to log on a bit earlier and log off a bit later. Everybody benefits. They're still not having to do that commute time and the business and the clients benefit as a result. So it, it, it's just making sure that you keep the balance, that you're able to retain the culture you mentioned. For me, that's critical. The way that we define and manage our culture has had to change and I think it will continue to evolve. But as long as you can ensure that there is a strength, a camaraderie, a unity, a collaborative environment and that your outcomes are the same or better, great. I'm an advocate for anything that does that, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, it Sometimes it can feel like a, an uphill struggle, but if you've got the right culture and the right people supporting you, that then it makes it feel a lot easier, doesn't it? I think it's just different struggles. So yesterday in my house, there were four children, a husband. There was soaring, banging, drilling, screwing. There was, you know, there was all manner of things going on around the house. Kids coming and going. It was like Piccadilly Circus, even though I have an office. But I still got a huge amount done. We found a way to work around those challenges. They're just different challenges than I would have had in the office. The relentless line of people coming and asking questions, even though you're trying to focus, just a different balance. Yeah, I do like your approach before, you know, you you find a way. And, you know, I think that's a great quality. And, you know, a lot of people could take some lessons from that because, uh, yeah, some people just like to go, oh, it's different and we don't like it. But yeah, you've got to find a way. You've got to try and do it. And sometimes, as you put rightly, you learn different skills skills on that journey and you come out of it stronger. And I think if you have adapted well during the lockdown period and you can uh, enjoy your time in the office, I think you come out of it stronger at the end, don't you, at the end of the day? Completely. Life is full of a lot of lessons. It's a constantly evolving journey. We don't live in an age where things stay the same. We live in an age where everything is changing all of the time. And that mental agility is not natural to some people. And it's how we learn how to support each other to make sure that the people who do have that naturally support the people who don't have that naturally and that we all come out in the best possible place because fundamentally we want you to succeed like you want us to succeed and we need our clients to succeed so that we can succeed so it's it's just a full melting pot of being supportive and guiding the way and helping people understand how and why. Some people can't do things unless they really understand why they need to do it. Others just need to be told how. So it's listening to how everybody needs to learn and grow and adapt so that that agility is just embedded into the organisational flow. 
I actually had a question for you, which I was going to ask you a bit later on about agility. And as we're on that topic, I'll dive straight into that. In your opinion, should agility be driven by strategy or do you kind of leave it up to the culture of the business? I think that's quite a tough question and um, not liking to sit on the fence, but I'm going to. It has to be both. It's all about balance. We have to be so multifaceted now as business people that you have to have a strategy that's underpinned by the expectation of agility. Because organisations that stay the same now, as proven by the many organisations that were in the Fortune 500 for many, many years that are suddenly not there anymore, you have to be agile. That has to be at the core of your strategic understanding as a business. But if you don't make that part of your culture, if it's not endemic to the people that you have, the two things will conflict against each other and will never end up being a reality and that has to be a people thing it has to be a facilities thing it has to be an offices thing it has to be a technology thing how you use things when you use things it has to be fluid yep couldn't agree more fluid is uh, probably a good term to describe the channel at times because it is constantly changing constantly evolving and I suppose that leads me into uh, the innovation conversation because uh, our sector, the channel, is renowned for pace of change and technologies moving. I do see innovation is, is say that widely used term that everyone is bounding around now and jumping on the bandwagon. What does that mean to you? And I suppose to Insight as well, what is innovation to you? Like most things, it doesn't mean one thing. It is by its very nature, if you innovate, you are looking at everything all of the time. For me, it it means asking the question, why? Why do we do that? Who said that was the right way to do things? It might have been the right way a year ago, but is it the right way now? Asking how we can improve. Can we do it better? Can we do it faster? Can we do it cheaper? How does the client do things? Why do they do it that way? How can they do it better, faster, cheaper? How do they become a digital innovator as opposed to digital prey? Everybody is having to drive forward at such a pace. I think it's you know it includes speed, efficiency, accuracy, multiple ways of engaging with each other because you can't just do things in one way anymore. You have to do them in multiple ways. The sheer volume of apps that I have on my telephone, let alone my laptop, to get my job done, that mental innovation that we go through all of the time to try and improve the experience of our teammates, the experience of our partners, the experience of our clients. That's innovation. It doesn't have to be big. So I'm a really big believer that, you know, some of those smaller items innovating at a tactical level can really pay strategic dividends. It's all of those tiny 0.1 percenters that added together make something incredible. I don't think it's a single you know, majorly strategic innovation that, that is always the winner. And I suppose in terms of the numbers that that you guys are doing across a mere 0.1 of a percent or 1%, it is a lot of money to the bottom line at the end of the day. Exactly, exactly. But it's also, you know, an innovation doesn't have to take months and it doesn't have to take years. In fact, it can be incredibly impactful if it's small and quick. So you have to scope and scale the the innovations that you're looking to achieve. But I would always have the quick wins area, the medium and more material area, and the more strategic, longer term innovations, because it should be constantly, that cycle is constantly re-evolving and re-evaluating itself. Because what I think is a strategic innovation today, in a year's time, might not be the right strategic innovation. So the quicker I can deliver or Insight can deliver those wins across the business that impact our client experience, the quicker that the client can benefit and can concentrate on their innovations 
rather than worrying about how their experience or how their engagements with us are going. We should be constantly pushing improvements for them. Just to add to that, I suppose uh, you are dealing with multiple cultural differences a- across Europe as well, and which I'm well familiar with in-, in terms of some of the challenges there. So how do you innovate and be agile as such a large organisation? And that's a really interesting point. And I think sometimes you've got to be a little bit more pirate. I don't know whether you're aware of a book that's called Be More Pirate. Now, the gentleman that wrote that book, we had him on a a training call not so long ago. I wouldn't advocate some of the things he did because they did, you know, sail very close to the wind of being illegal. But the principle is sometimes you have to ask for forgiveness rather than permission. Sometimes you have to be dogmatic or blinkered to some of the nuances and consequences if you can see that you know strategically you're going to improve the client experience. You know, if we put the client at the center of everything we do, closely wrapped by the health, safety, well-being, and care of our teammates then the other things will follow because we won't be making recommendations or innovation requests that are ridiculous and that would cause problems. If we're all singing from the same hymn sheet as a global organisation, then we can drive and deliver all of that progress together. Everybody would be together on that journey. To break it down a little bit, really good communication, give people clarity talk to them, engage with them, make them part of the solution. These things are all our own ownership. We all own collectively making the organisation great. We all own collectively uh, making the client experience great. It's not just somebody in a little ivory tower going, I have a jolly wheeze this week, I'm going to innovate something. It's that constant innovation that happens in at all of those levels that continue to keep driving us forward. And those can come from any language, any culture, any office, any level within the business. And so they should. Now, there are some legal and regulatory compliance and audit challenges that we all have to face as big global organisations. And of course, they are subtly different in countries across EMEA. But you learn your subject. Those are things that I have to know as part of my job. And I have to be able to understand them and build them into my plan. But thus far, so obviously I was a sales uh, person and a sales leader within Insight for 22 years. I've been doing this role for three years. And you learn your craft. I have to know those things. They're just built into now how I work every day. And, you know, I'll try different countries to pilot different things in because the pressure points from the clients are are different. And generally, you know, they work. They're a great success. We roll them out to everywhere else. Everybody's delighted. And if it doesn't work out, that's fine. We all make mistakes. We lance the boil, as it were, and move on to whatever the next great thing is going to be. Thankfully, we haven't had too many boils, but, you know, it it happens. It certainly does, yes. And uh, obviously, compliance is is a key part of all all our roles these days. And uh, it's making sure that, you know, we can all sort of innovate, strategize and do everything within those compliance regulations. That's absolutely critical dealing with any enterprise business these days. Yeah, and not just compliance. You know, I think things like the environmental piece, the social value piece, corporate governance, you know, that's kind of the corporate governance piece, if you like. But as a big global organisation, the other two top of mind things are the environment and our social value. So every decision we make has so many moving parts and so many considerations. But if you allow that paralysis by analysis or you allow that to prevent you from moving forward, then you want, you must understand as an organisation that you will slow yourself down, which will effectively mean that you are not ahead of the game. You're not supporting your clients, your partners and your teammates in the right way. And that will have a material impact on your business. So you have to find, back to my original statement, you just have to find a way. <laughs> Stop giving yourself excuses and get on with it. Yeah, and otherwise you lose your agility, which exactly. is something that we've been talking about. Just moving on to um, 
my next question is, and after looking around uh, the Insight website again, as I'm doing a bit of research, there's a lot of focus on digital innovation and those words come very much bounding out of the Insight website. I'd kind of like to know in terms of that, the strategy behind that, is that sort of uh, digital innovation, is that going to be led predominantly by traditional tier one vendors or is there a mix of merging tech in there? And are those emerging tech vendors starting to challenge the spaces that might have been occupied by your more traditional, I suppose, strategic vendors? I go back to my, I don't like to sit on the fence, but I'm going to. So the thing with this <laughs> is that that there remain some fantastic tier one organizations, you know, Microsoft, HP, Cisco, you know, those organizations have been real significant in the global marketplace and continue to innovate. They continue to, you know, invest in their R and D and continue to drive the world forward. And you know, for them, long may that last. But let's be clear: we have got a great partnership with Facebook now for their Oculus product. Who'd have thought that an organisation like ours would have a relationship with Facebook? Historically, it wouldn't have happened. They didn't exist when I started in the IT industry, and I'm sure yourself, Ian. There are lots of emerging tech vendors that we have to allow and have to look at and have to talk about. Now, of course, it's a it's a fine art to back the right horses and to figure out which ones you're going to invest your time and money in. But we have to do that because they're taking market share, significant market share from legacy vendors because they're innovating quicker because they're being more agile because they you know they're doing different things but what's fascinating is where we saw clients really downsizing on the supply chain we only want to deal with one vendor you know we're going to really streamline what's happened now because of the world in which we work we've simplified how technology hands together and how it collaborates with itself. But we have hugely complicated how many vendors that you really need to come up with the best solution. I I like to call that polymorphic simplification, which basically is an oxymoron and means that it's not bloody simple at all. <laughs> it's really important that we, you know, follow the latest trends. We have people in our organization who track what's coming along and we select what we think are the best of the emerging vendors to back in conjunction with the tier one vendors. And I think now that there's room for everybody, because to my telephone point earlier, I've got hundreds of apps on my phone. Would I like one that did everything because I'm getting old these days, Ian, and, you know, that would make my life maybe a bit easier? Maybe, but I'd rather have the best of breed so I know I'm getting the best solution. I need my Just Eat app and my Uber Eats app because from different places you get a better service. Ah, oh dear, brilliant. Now, uh, that's one thing I've not experienced, unfortunately, where I live. Uh, out in the sticks, Just Eat is not a thing. So, yeah. I kind of wish it wasn't a thing, but it's a good tactical example. If we're going to innovate, we have to allow people to be innovative and we have to take it seriously. And, you know, some will succeed and rise and become global phenomenon like Uber. Uber, like you know, other other organisations that didn't exist five years ago, and and others that didn't exist two years ago. Yeah, the, the unicorns, as they call them, the book, completely. The world. Yeah, and, and what I find with some of the emerging tech companies that we work with, that actually some of them are actually really good complementary products to the the, the the likes of Microsoft. And we work with a couple of vendors that are you know, really good fit, and and are actually even recommended by Microsoft and. It's actually kind of quite good to see them playing nicely and and supporting those innovative tech companies. Yeah, I think that ecosystem, that development of the ecosystem, people talked about ecosystems 20 years ago, but there was a really deep-seated resistance to it because it is more complicated potentially to manage multiple points of entry into your organization and to manage, you know, solutions that are ultimately across multiple vendors. 
but actually if you get your ecosystem right and your, your process for managing that ecosystem, the impact and the benefit that you know, your clients see and that your teammates see really helps everybody get on with their jobs an awful lot better. And so the value can be you know, really material. Yeah, no, there's a lot of uh, interesting stuff going on there. We, we see vendors come and go. Some obviously will be acquired along the journey. And in fact, I read a, a stat a few years ago that I think in uh, when the, our industry w- was born, there was something like 500 software companies globally. And one of those w- w- was Microsoft. And out of the 500 that were around in the, I suppose, uh, 80s that, that emerged, Microsoft are the only one left. Because all the others have either been acquired, consumed, changed, evolved, gone. I think the Forrester chap I was speaking to the other day, uh, Jay McBain, was saying, you know, they're they're tracking 800,000 emerging tech companies as we speak. So from 500 to 800,000. Exactly. So my point earlier of we've got some great people who are tracking hopefully using Forrester as uh, giving them some guidance, those emerging vendors will never cover them all. It, it's an impossibility. But hopefully we will pick ones that we really feel to our client marketplaces. And in terms of just sort of obviously talking about innovation and culture, and, and we've touched on sort of European business, I believe that you know business culture is really important to innovation and how an organization approaches emerging tech, et cetera. As part of a large US-based organization, do you see cultural differences between how the business adopts, promotes, and onboards emerging tech? As an underlying principle, we have a very similar approach. And one of the things that I really like about Insight is that you know we do try and do things globally in a similar manner. And we want to ensure that everybody gets the same experience and that should be the best experience. But clearly, culturally and linguistically and, and even from a vendor perspective, you know, they don't do things themselves the same globally. So we have to be adaptable and agile to how the clients are looking at technology because clients are perhaps doing it at a different way at a different time at different speed. We have to be um, sensitive to how the vendor has set themselves up, structured themselves globally because nobody truly that I found operates in a single global manner. Maybe Microsoft and Cisco were the the closest, uh, Dell perhaps, but there are still localisms and they don't all release the same tech at the same time. So, you know, we are forced then, the market forces mean that we have to do things at a different time in a different way. But as far as it's possible, I think that we try to onboard things in the same way at the same time, where they're the large existing technology organizations and where they're the smaller innovators. We'll look at what might be right for the local market. I definitely agree with that. And uh, it's always been a challenge because obviously the slightly different versions as well. And I think even if we look at the big broadline distributors and the, the line cards that they have in the different regions are different from my understanding. Yes, they might all carry HP and Lenovo, but when you start digging down into some of the lesser known vendors that they, they do carry, they, they do tend to be different in, in the regions, which would suggest that even they are doing that localization piece. Yeah, absolutely. Just to add on to that, quite often you hear, particularly when you're talking about emerging tech vendors, that the US is a little bit more open to investment in the emerging tech companies. I don't know if you heard anything to support that. Maybe because it's much bigger and it's got more money. I can't say that I am a an investment expert, but that is generally the case. It's interesting because even our clients in, in the US, some of them are really ahead of the curve in in certain technology investment areas but actually there are lots of others that are much further behind so there's a really huge difference between the leaders and the bottom of the followers to me it feels like in the UK and EMEA maybe we're we're more consistent 
So we might take a little bit longer, but we do it more thoroughly and more across the board as opposed to creating lots of little islands of of investment and using the technology. I think that's a difficult a difficult question to answer. It is. And um, yeah, sorry, sorry for no, putting on the spot though with that one. I find it fascinating as to obviously you've only got to turn around and there's another unicorn company coming out of the US, an emerging tech company. And uh, we, we work with a lot of pre-IPO organizations as vendors and uh, that they all seem to be going through first second third rounds of funding and they go on this ipo journey and it's a success story and you hear a lot of obviously san francisco based companies that are these success stories but there seem to be fewer and far between over the pond here yes i don't know whether it's that you don't hear about them or whether they don't exist i think the two things don't need to be mutually exclusive and i, and I do think that perhaps that's where you know if you want investment funding, even if you're British or you're Chinese, you may well gravitate to that San Francisco area because you know that's the place to go. And they actually genuinely do constant rounds of having people through the door to pick which companies they're going to invest in. That's a a standard cycle for that area. And that doesn't mean it doesn't happen elsewhere, but it perhaps doesn't happen to the same magnitude. Yeah, no, no, that that actually makes sense. And uh, I'll perhaps have to find a a, a British-owned one that's been through that journey and uh, an American one and see if uh, get them on the podcast and compare the journey. Yeah, that would be interesting. In terms of, um, I suppose, winding things down a little bit and a bit more of something of a relaxed question, your favourite tech gadget? You've obviously mentioned your phone quite a, a bit. I'm guessing it's going to be your smartphone. No, no, that is absolutely not my favourite tech gadget. It's not my favourite. It probably drives uh, it's you not, mad Yes, <laughs> firstly, because it never stops ringing. Secondly, because yes. then, you know, WhatsApp, text, Facebook, I mean, you know, just the constant round of people wanting to talk to you. And I actually, more than that, I keep breaking the screen. It doesn't matter whether I've got a screen protector on it. So that's actually my least favourite piece of tech. I, I have answered this question before with some somebody else and my most favorite piece of tech is my arc mouse my microsoft arc mouse because it bends and it goes flat so it fits in a pocket in my handbag i've been carrying them around now goodness me it's got to be going on 10 years but it remains my favorite piece of tech and i've even got the oculus headset which is a running up a close second because now i've had full training and i i can do immersive vr with my team and with the the um, leadership team which is an entirely different experience than just doing a teams call or a zoom call but my mouse still wins everybody should get themselves a clicky bendy mouse <laughs> that's a great recommendation Jill and uh, yeah I, I'm the same with you with with, um, with the smartphone I do I must admit I'd be lost without it but um, I too get into trouble for, for going through phones like you know, <laughs> to break them the other thing that I always ask which is a bit of a strange ask and it, it started we did a podcast series last year and, and it started then and I always ask and it's quite an interesting conversation with, with our US cousins do you have or, or do you follow the football thing? Everyone was a footballer fan a few months ago when we were in the Euros. Would you be kind enough to try and uh, predict the English top four finalists for, for this uh, coming season? So I am a Spurs supporter. My husband is an Arsenal supporter. Oh, that's difficult. Isn't that? <laughs> We've been married 25 years-ish, so, you know, not that difficult, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> and we discussed this yesterday, actually, because I knew, um, in fairness, I've been cheating, so I knew that you asked this question. So I thought, I'm going to be ready. So we have, this is the Holloway household prediction, okay. which interestingly contains neither Spurs nor Arsenal. So, so we go. I don't. Think, I think this is an uncontroversial response. So we're going right. for one Man United, oh. two Liverpool, three Chelsea, okay. four Man City. Wow, that is a prediction, isn't it? You know what? I'd, I'd be very happy with that, Joe. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm originally very... a Mancunian, so I suppose there's some ah. sort of um, uh, a thing in there from my youth but yeah. um that is what we have collectively debated it 
and that's what we've decided. So I shall keep that part of my book until this time next year and um, you know, congratulate myself on the quiet or yeah, laugh. Yeah, no, no. It'll end up being Brentford. Well, actually, we have had a guest that actually has sort of uh, has put, I suppose, a token gesture towards Brentford because of uh, their sort of success story. And it has, I suppose, uh, you know, Leicester was uh, exactly. a exactly few years ago. And, and I don't think there was any sort of supporter out there of sport that deny Leicester that win because it's just great to see, isn't and it? And that the thing about that Leicester win at the time was it was so unifying for everybody. Everybody was delighted. It didn't matter which team you naturally supported. Genuinely didn't hear anybody critique in a negative way that celebration. Yeah, and that, that's a massively powerful message, uh, you know, just coming back to, to business, isn't it? You know, if somebody's doing something going above and beyond and that they absolutely deliver on it. You know, I think that's a massive. British thing. We do like the underdog. Not yeah. quite sure that that is entirely uh, supported by you know, all countries, but I think we, we certainly have that thing of, uh, of you know, really all getting behind the underdog. I did uh, enjoy that in the Euros. Obviously, I was cheering England on, but it was also nice to cheer on some of the teams like Hungary and Sweden that were really battling it out, and it was great to see. Absolutely. So, okay. All good. Well, thank you very much for taking the time out to, to join us on the podcast series. Really enjoyed the chat. You've got some great experience there and some great insight into uh, uh, innovation and, and particularly, uh, you know, I, I, lo- I loved your opinions of, of business culture. Um, hopefully we'll catch up soon. And um, thanks for your time. You're very welcome. Thanks for listening to this episode of ASM Connected, the podcast from ASM Technologies with guest Jill Holloway. If you want to find out more about the team at ASM Technologies or about anything discussed in the podcast, visit asmtech.com. And if you've enjoyed this episode, subscribe now and never miss an update. Thanks for listening to ASM Connected.